But turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter this evening. If you didn't bring a Bible, the ushers are there in the aisle. They have extra Bibles. Be glad to let you use one of ours. Just raise your hand. And it'll help you if you'll turn in the Bible with us and find these scriptures. Let your eyes rest on them. Remind yourself these are not the words of men, but the faithful, life-giving words of God. We're going to 1 Corinthians, 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. And down in verse 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks, you can say it with me, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Say it one more time. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn right over just to page or two to 2 Corinthians then. 2 Corinthians, the second chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For our purposes, we'll just stop right there for now. But say it again. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Say it again. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Now we begin looking at, I want to continue this evening as the Lord would enable us, to see this connection between thanksgiving and victory. Thanksgiving and victory. Thanks be unto God. I want you to, to go back to the first verse we read, just a page or two there, and look at it again, 1 Corinthians 15:57 says, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. Now let me ask you the question, is giveth past tense or present tense or future tense? Giveth. We'd say today, gives. It's not past tense. We would say has given. We wouldn't say gives if we're referring to the past. It's appropriate. It's right to thank God for past victories. We know that. But so many times that's all the understanding people have when you start talking about thanksgiving, they only know to look back and thank God for what has happened, what the Lord did do. And that's good. That's excellent. But we're talking about something else. Giveth us the victory. Giveth. Giveth refers to now and the future. Would we be thanking God for something that hasn't happened yet? Yes. Come on, read it out loud again for me. What does it say? But thanks, but thanks be to God. What? Not, not which has given. Gives us the victory. Are we thanking God for something 
that hasn't happened yet in the natural giveth. We're talking about present and future victories. But we're thanking God now. Is there a connection between thanking God now and experiencing victories tomorrow? Yes, there is. And that's what we want to dwell on. Go to 2 Corinthians. Same thing is there. 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, 14. Read it out loud with me again. What does it say? Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes, has caused, no, causes, and this has got to be future tense, he's talking about always causes, causes now and perpetually causes. Tomorrow after tomorrow after tomorrow without end. Always causes us to triumph in Christ. Now again, is he thanking God about something, about victory and triumph in the future? Yes, he is. So while it's good to look back and thank God, for victories and triumph that he's given us in the past, it is a powerful thing to thank God now for victory and triumph not yet experienced. It is an accessor of grace. It is an accessor. Now think about it. Isn't it faith? To thank God for something you don't see yet and something you don't feel yet, isn't that faith? And isn't it, you know, by faith that we access the grace wherein everything's been provided for us in the Lord, in the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus? Yes. And one of the simplest ways and yet one of the most powerful ways to get in faith And to stay in faith is to simply thank God continually. Not in a dead religious ritualistic way, but in a believing way. In a sincere way, in a genuine way. Thanking God, thanking God, thanking God, thanking God. I know you've heard me tell this before, but it'll bear repetition. Young man came to me, you know, this must have been 20 some years ago, after a service, and he said, Brother Keith, I need help. I said, what, what can I do for you? He said, well, I smoke, and I want to quit, but I can't. I've tried everything in the world, and I just can't quit. Now, first of all, you know, Phyllis touched on this Sunday. There's a lot of people that are in so much condemnation about smoking. But you can love the Lord with all your heart and smoke like a stack. (laughs) It's just a bad habit. Hmm? Ain't nobody going to hell for smoking or drinking or lying or stealing or adultery. Did you hear me? Because the blood of the Lamb can cleanse from anything and everything that defiles or is wrong, or harmful, or damaging? No. But this young man wanted to be free. Now, you know, if you smoke, and you like to smoke, well, you ain't going to get free. (laughs) But if you decide you want to get free, well, there is help. But but don't, don't stay away from church. Don't stay away from God because you smoke. That's ignorance. Uh, he said, Brother Keith, I've thrown away a cigarette by the carton. I've, I've been prayed for. I don't know how many times I've, I've had stuff uh, put into me and stuff cast out of me, and I've rebuked and bound, and I've been to this one. I mean, he went through all kind of stuff, and he said, and I, and I still smoke. I can't quit. 
I, I can't quit. I've done everything I know to do, and I just can't quit. And he must have said that 12 times while we're standing there. I've tried everything in the world, and I can't quit. I can't quit. I can't quit. I wish I could, but I can't. I want to quit, but I can't. Now, what does he believe? He believes he can't quit. And where is he? He's bound. Is he thankful for anything in this situation? No. No. Now, we asked this question before. Is there a place in between being thankful and being unthankful? Is there a place where you're not thankful, but you're not unthankful either? You're neither one. There is no place like that, which means if you're not thankful, you're unthankful. Don't let that get away from you now. So I, I told him, I said, well, will you do what I tell you to? He said, oh, Brother Keith, don't ask me to throw my cigarettes away. And, I, and, I, and I've been praying. I said, I'm not going to ask you to throw anything away. He said, okay. <laughs> I said, will you do something? I'm going to ask you. He said, I don't know. Is it hard? I said, just, well, listen. Are you willing to? I said, you can do it if you will. Are you willing to? He said, I guess. What, what is it? I said, never again. Say, I can't quit. Treat it like cuss words. I mean, not one more time. Let that come out of your mouth. Remember the scripture said, your words have been styled against me? The Lord says you're free and you say you're bound. You're contradicting him. You're opposing him, his words, with your words. And how many know Colossians says, he has delivered us from all the power of darkness. Amen. Has which means you're free. Whether you look it and feel it, experience it or not, it's bought and paid for. Amen. I said, never again say, I can't quit. He looked at me with a puzzled look. I said, you going to do it or not? <laughs> well, I, yeah. I said, you can. It's totally up to you. I said, you've tried all this other stuff. Won't you do this? He said, well, I reckon I could. I said, good. And this is what you say. Every time anything reminds you of a cigarette or nicotine, I want you to say, thank you, Lord, for setting me free from cigarettes. He said, when I get free, I said, right now. He said, but I, he started to say, I can't quit. He said, I can't. I said, I you said you weren't going to say that anymore. Now there are people that are mock and scoff at this. Oh, saying that ain't going to make any difference. Well, you're going to stay in bondage. Because you don't believe what Jesus said. You don't believe the Bible. As long as you scoff and make fun, you're just going to stay bound. And I'm talking about this example, but I know this works in every area. It works with alcohol. It works with drugs. It works with pornography. It works with, uh, you know, overspending. It works with anything. You need grace. You need help. You need to quit begging and pulling and talking about what you can't. And you need to start thanking God. Oh, come on, now you need to start thanking God for the answer and for the help, and that's an act of faith, and it'll access the grace that you lack and need to make the difference. Maybe in and of yourself, you're not enough and don't have enough to get it done, but God's grace is sufficient. I, I explain, I said, every time you pull out a cigarette and you light it up, I want you to say, thank you, Lord, I'm free from nicotine. In between drags, in between puffs, I want you to say, I'm free. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free from cigarettes. Thank you. He said, yeah, but I'll be smoking. I said, I know it. I said, you're already smoking. You've been smoking for years. I said, will you do it? 
He said, but I'll be smoking, Brother Keith. I said, I know you'll be smoking. I had to talk to him. So I said, every time you pull a pack out of your pocket, you lay it on the nightstand, I want you to, every, anything that reminds you of a cigarette, you put it out. I want you to say, if you're around other people and don't want them to hear it, that's fine. Say it under your breath. When you're by yourself, say it out loud. And say, thank you, Lord. I'm free from cigarettes. Every time you buy some, every time you do anything, will you do it? He said, well, okay, but I'll be smoking. I said, I know you'll be smoking. You're already smoking. <laughs> he left. I guess it was about three or four weeks. I was at that same place, and he came in the back door, and I didn't even have to ask him. His face is beaming, and he made a beeline for me. I could tell just looking at him. He said, guess what? Guess what? I said, ah, let me see. <laughs> Before I could say, he said, I'm free. I'm free. He said, let me tell you what happened, Brother Key. Let me tell you what happened. He said, he said, when I left, I just didn't know about that. He said, but I told you I'd do it, and you were so firm about it. So I thought, well, I better do it. I told him I'd do it. And so anything that reminded me, he said, I smoked and I smoked. <laughs> and he said, and I'd say, thank you, Lord, I'm free. Thank you, Lord, I'm free. Thank, he said, I did it so much night and day, it got to be uh, a habit with me in a way, and I'd say it without even thinking. It just, it just got to be my routine. I lit up, and I said, thank you for setting me free. I put it out, thank you, I'm free. Thank you, I'm, thank you for setting me free. And he said, after, you know, you know, after two or three weeks, he said, it's just part of smoking. You smoke and you say, thank you, Lord, for setting me free. And he said, I was standing on the, the corner uh, uh, on the sidewalk ready to cross the street by a, a, a lamppost thing. And he said, I, I was saying it again. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free. And he said, something hit me. And I knew I was free. I, he says, something hit me and came up in me, and I just knew that I knew that I was free. He said, I put that one out. I haven't had one since. I don't want one. I don't need one. He said, Brother Keith, I'm free. I'm free. Now, that, that testimony perfectly illustrates what we're talking about. What if he'd waited until he got free, then he's going to thank God for setting him free? It wouldn't have happened. But while he was thanking God, thanks be unto God who giveth us. Oh, come on, can you see it? The victory. Thanks be unto God who causes us. While he was thanking God, God was causing him to triumph. While he was thanking God, God was giving him grace and victory over this bondage that was too strong for him alone. Oh, friends, that was worth you combing your hair and coming to church tonight. I'm telling you, this, this is the, I don't care what you're dealing with, you can come out of it. You can overcome doing exactly what he did. Just apply it to your area. Oh, I'm excited about this. Glory to God. Now, last week I referred to a passage of Scripture. You remember what it was? Well, I referred to more than one, didn't I? <laughs> First Kings 21 that we didn't get to. and I told you I wasn't going to put all my marbles out. And this was a great big shiny marble and I was saving it for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Turn to 1 Kings 21. And get ready. Stay awake and focus. I believe this is one of the most important series the Lord has given us thus far. And that's saying a lot. So stay hooked. 
Stay, stay focused. And I'm telling you, things that have troubled you in your life, you can get free from them. Amen. The answer here is here for things that have chronically bothered people and things that folks have struggled with for years and not been free. The answer's here. I said the answer's here. The answer's here. All you got to do is put into practice some of the things that we're going to be looking at. Now, it's going to require some changes in you. Did I lose somebody? It's going to require some change, and, and I, it won't always be easy because everybody's used to living and being a certain way. And some things people yield to without even realizing they're yielding to it. And they think certain ways and do certain things, and to them it's normal because they've been doing it for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And, and that's where the challenge comes in, is in changing that. And when you've been doing something a certain way and been acting and living and thinking and feeling and talking a certain way for decade after decade, it's, you're rooted in it. And the, the challenge is to keep the Word in front of you night and day at long enough to change so that now the way of the Word becomes normal to you. Amen. That's where the challenge comes in. But if you're willing to do it, your life will change. And the things that have been holding you back and holding you down will fall off of you. And just like that young man got free, you'll get free. You'll be free too. 1 Kings 21. What are we talking about tonight? Thanksgiving and victory. Right? Thanksgiving victory. 1 Kings, the 21st chapter. 1 Kings 21. This is a story about King Ahab and his wife Jezebel and another individual named Naboth. Have you read this before? You're familiar with what happened here? We're going to dissect this a bit tonight. There are real answers here. And don't be looking around thinking about your brother or sister. You want to be examining yourself real, real carefully and closely. How does this apply to me? Have I done this? Have I thought this way? Have I felt this way? Because we're now getting into the part that I was referring to earlier of the parts where we change. Verse 1, 1 Kings 21, 1. It came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. It joined the king's property. And Ahab spoke to Naboth, and he said, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it's near to my house, and I'll give you for it a better vineyard than it, or... If it seemed good to you, if you want me to, I'll give you the worth of it in money. I'll give you a better vineyard, a better piece of property. Or if you don't want that, I'll give you money. Whatever you say it's worth, I'll pay you the money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. He didn't just say, I don't want to. What did he say? The Lord. the Lord told me I can't. And really it was in the word about uh, inheritance remaining in families. And he knew this uh, and are from the Lord and the word. It, to him it was very plain and very clear. The Lord said, no, I can't do it. It's not I don't want to do it. Not I'm looking for a better deal. The Lord told me, no, I can't do it. Now, I suspect that was uh, kind of difficult for him to tell him, him being the king and all, right? And, of course, King Ahab has got a terrible reputation for being a cruel man, a destroyer, a murderer, a worshiper of false gods, you name it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Naboth felt like he was taking his life in his hands to refuse him. 
and tell him, no, I'm not going to sell it to you. I can't. And uh, I think you can hear it in his language. He's not saying, no, I don't want to sell it to you. He said, I can't. The Lord has told me, no, I can't sell it to you. Now look what happened next. Ahab came to his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He's saying the Lord has told me this is supposed to stay in our family. It was passed down to me from my forefathers and I'm going to pass it on to my kids. And that's what the Lord told us to do. And I, I, can't, I can't let you have it. And he laid him down on his bed, and he turned away his face, and he would eat no bread. What's he doing? Yeah, he's pouting. <laughs> what else is he doing? Is he thankful at all? No thankfulness is not in the room with him are probably in the same county, <laughs> right? He's about as far from being thankful as you can be. Oh, friends, I want you to learn something now. Is it a problem when you're not thankful? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> Let me read some other translations of this to you. The, the New English says, Ahab went to his palace bitter and angry. He lay down on his bed and pouted and would not eat. The, the English version says, he went home depressed and angry. The NAS says, he came to his house sullen and vexed. He's sully, he's vexed, he's bitter, he's angry, he's depressed, he's pouting. Is he unthankful? Yes. Now we read last week, in Matthew 16, do you remember? Where that Jesus was telling his disciples about how he's about to suffer a lot of things of the religious leadership and of the uh, civil authorities and, and he's going to be killed. And, and Peter took him aside and rebuked him. You remember we read about this. Rebuked him and said, no, this is not going to happen to you. And the margin of my Bible says, he said, pity yourself. And Jesus responded with one of the strongest rebukes and responses you'll see him do. He wheeled around. He said, get behind me, Satan. This is strong. What was the situation? Well, let me read it to you. In fact, you, in, in, in case I should say you, you weren't here, what, uh, don't, don't turn there. But Jesus said in other translations, he said, you're an obstacle in my way. Get away from me, Satan. He said uh, in God's word translation, get out of my way, Satan. You're tempting me to sin. The basic English says, get out of my way, Satan. You're a danger to me. This is why he responded so strongly. Fast forward just a little bit of time, just a little bit of time. Jesus is in the garden. He's sweating blood. He's in an agony. Over what? Over what? Over going through with this. As terrible as being nailed to the cross physically was, as terrible as being scourged at the post physically was, that's not the biggest thing he's drawing back from. If it were, there's others that have been more heroic acting. No. He didn't deserve to be made sin. He's never been separated from the Father. He doesn't deserve to be judged and separated from the Father. And he sees and knows full well what's about to happen to his spotless, sinless 
soul, and spirit. He took in himself or allowed to be put in him and on him all the terrible, horrible sin of every human being that has ever lived and ever will. The prophet looking at him, Isaiah, looking at him through the centuries to come by the Spirit. He wasn't seeing Jesus in the flesh. He's seeing him in the Spirit. And he said his visage was so marred he didn't even look like a man. Right. What the soldiers did to him alone wouldn't have been enough to do that. To say it doesn't even look like a man. This is what happened to him inside. He didn't deserve it. He never sinned. But he knows he can't let himself think about that for one moment. Oh, come on, can you see it? You're, he said, you're a danger to me. You're tempting me to sin. You don't care about the things of God. You're talking about the things of men. The margin says, pity yourself. And he rebuked Peter Sternly. Is self pity a dangerous thing? Yes. Oh, friend, it's just absolutely one of the most dangerous things there is in all the life experience. What's Ahab doing right now? Is he feeling sorry for himself? You see all the evidences of it, don't you? He came home. He fell across the bed. He won't eat. He's so sad. <laughs> Never mind. He's king. He's got vineyards all over the place. He lives in the palace. He's got people waiting on him hand and foot. Night and day, he wears a fi some of the finest clothes in the world, some of the finest jewelry in the world. He's got some of the finest chariots and horses in the world. He's king. He had everything. But there was one thing he wanted, and he got his mind on that until everything else he had meant nothing. Can you see the trick of the devil? Can you see the ploy of the devil? Friend, there will always be something else to long for. There will always be something else to want. It's a lie to believe that if, if I can just get this one thing, if I can just get this, I'll be happy. This starts from the time people are little children. If, if I can just get Robo Man. Or submarine girl, if I if I can just get <laughs> the whole blast off series. If if I can just get, then I'm gonna be happy. Is it true? No, no, no you might be enthralled for an hour. Right? And then before long, usually not very long at all, what's going on? There's something else. If I could just get that new bike. <laughs> and we should learn and grow up. But the truth is, you got 50-year-olds doing exactly the same thing. If I could just get that big house, if I could just get that that new car, if I could just get that promotion, if I could just get that raise, if I could just get that, then I'd be set. I'd be happy. It is a lie. Never, ever is there anything 
that you get and that's it. Now you're happy, now you're satisfied from now. It is a lie. If you can't be happy and satisfied without that thing, you can't be happy and satisfied with it. Because it can't give it to you. I don't care how much it costs or what it is, there is no thing, there is no person that can give you that complete contentment and satisfaction that only comes from the Lord. Thank you, Master. The Scripture says, Proverbs 27, 20, don't turn there, just listen, says, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. There's always something else to get your eyes on and to get to wanting. Ecclesiastes 5.10. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver. He that loves abundance, he won't be satisfied with increase. You say, well, if I can just make a million, I'll be happy. No, you won't. You'll want 10. Well, if I could just make a billion, <laughs> I'd be happy. No, you won't. Oh, if you can't be happy with $100, you can't be happy with $100 billion. It's just a fact. Now, money's a good tool. It's good to have it. It's good to, to use to help other people and meet your needs. But you cannot be satisfied and made content. There is not any amount of money that will give it to you. <laughs> Think about it. Ahab is the king. Think about what this man has. Think about what he live, how he lives. He ain't tied his sandals in 20 years. He don't even shave himself or fix his own hair. He could spend a whole month just going from one property of his to the other and looking at it and surveying it. He's got, all, he's got everything, and yet it means nothing to him, nothing, because he doesn't have this one thing that belongs to Naboth. Is he unthankful? Yes. Is he feeling sorry for himself? Yes. Now see, let, let's go back and, and examine this. How did this happen? How did this get to this place? Somebody say a thought. He was on his place, and Naboth's vineyard joined his property. He was out there on his line one day, and he said, You know, it would be good to have this. It joins my property. And he began to entertain a thought. I ought to have this. Well, I'll just get this. He'll sell it to me. Or I'll trade him out of it. And in his mind, it's a done deal. <laughs> He's already decided what Naboth should do and is going to do. And he's already plot, plotting it. For you to use another term, he's already arranging the furniture. He's making plans. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Why? Because I should have it. I'm going to have it. It's just a matter of formality. We'll just have to, I'll talk to him and go through the paperwork. And of course, he's the king and he's used to getting his way. Friend, there are deadly thoughts. They seem innocent enough when they begin. But it is a presuming and assuming 
And it comes down to this. I deserve it. We touched on this last week. But friend, we, we got to keep coming back to it. You hear people use this terminology all the time. Well, you, you've worked hard. You deserve it. You know, well, y'all are good people. You, you should have it. You deserve it. No, you don't. No, you don't. And I don't. Break yourself of this. Remove this word from your vocabulary when it has to do with what you should have or what should be done for you. Because, go, go with me to a scripture. I'll hold your place here. <clears throat> go to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Keep your place in 1 Kings. We're not through with that. But in 1 Corinthians, they'll put it up on the screen for us. 1 Corinthians 10. What's Ahab doing? He's feeling sorry for himself. Why? He had this thing worked up in his mind how it was going to be. And it didn't turn out that way. And so now, he's completely unthankful about everything else he has and is obsessed with this one piece of land and has decided he can't be happy unless he has that. 1 Corinthians 10, 30. Ten thirty. He says, If I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Sit out loud, by grace, by grace a, partaker, a partaker, for that, for, that. For, which I give for which I give thanks. Is there a connection between giving thanks and being a partaker? Is there a connection between being a partaker and grace? Yes. The only way God would be able to make you and I a partaker of what's provided is by grace. Faith's involved, but it's by grace. And the Lord said this to me some years ago. There's two statements we've been talking about, and, and I'm, I've gotten so much more light than I've ever had about it before. I'm, I'm excited about it. He said to me, you cannot be gracious to someone who feels they deserve it. Impossible. If someone feels it is owed to them, they deserve it, they have made it impossible for you to minister grace to them. Can you see this? And this is so with God, which is why half the New Testament deals with works versus grace, right? And he keeps telling you again and again, you are saved by grace, through faith, not of works. It's the gift of God. Why are you saved? Not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, not because God owed it to you. It's a gift, completely by his grace. But if you stand up and start hollering about, you got, God, you, you got to do this for me, you owe me, now you've made it impossible for him to give you grace. Let's say if Ahab had gotten in faith about it and just stayed happy and free and stayed thankful and said, well, okay, hey, it's your vineyard. I understand. All right. And he was gracious with him even though he was his subject then it would have been, I don't know if the Lord would have done it or not, but it would have been possible for God to be gracious. Oh, come on, can you see it? And for Naboth to be gracious. And say, well, look, the Lord's told me it's okay. I can let you have this. In that case, he would have been pleasantly surprised. 
and thankful because he wouldn't have felt like he deserved it or it was owed to him at all. He'd have went glory to God. The Lord's been gracious to me. But when he's already got it made up in his mind, he's supposed to do this. He's, he should do this. He owes me this. I deserve this. Now it is impossible for God or Naboth to be gracious to him. And when you take it out of the realm of grace, you cut off all that God can do for you. Is this serious or not? I've said this for years. I didn't even know fully what I'm, I was saying, and I'm sure I'll learn more about it later, but I wrote it down. Years ago, I said, when it comes to people, I'm going to expect nothing and be thankful for everything. Amen. I might say it maybe a little more accurately like this. When it comes to other people, presume nothing. You know what I'm saying when I say expect. We expect from God. But we don't know who he's going to use and how it's going to work. But when it comes to what other people would or could or should do for us, see to it that you do not allow yourself to presume anything. Right? And if you'll be like that, you won't be disappointed when they don't do it. <laughs> but you'll be surprised and thankful when they do. <laughs> If you never got upset again from now to the end of your life, if you never got upset again about something that somebody didn't do for you, think how many days you wouldn't waste. Now it gets worse. You've read the story. It gets much, much worse. Tell me again, how did this start? Started with a thought. Romans 8, 6 says to be carnally minded is death. You're going to see in just a few moments. You, if you read it, you know it. Death works out of this. To be carnally minded is death. Does it matter what you let yourself think on? It's the difference between life and death. That's not an exaggeration. That's Romans 8. Amen. There are thoughts, my friend, there are thoughts that are deadly dangerous. You need to recognize them when they come. It's why Jesus wheeled around and said, Get behind me, Satan. Because that thought, pity yourself. Oh, come on, can you see it? Can we get strong? Come on. Can we get strong in our spirit? Can we recognize any thought? You deserve better. You should have this. They owe you. Can you recognize that and go, no, no. Get behind me, Satan. I don't expect, I don't, one thing. From them. Right? And let me begin to go over everything I've got. And what God's done for me. Everything I'm enjoying. Ahab could have thanked God for the next six months and not gone over the same item twice. He's king. He's got everything. But no, he's laying in the bed. Making himself sick, mad, hurt, grieved. Go back, let's finish the story. Jezebel, his wife, came to him, verse 5, and she said to him, What's wrong, baby? Why are you so sad? Oh, baby. 
Dr. Ken Stewart preached a sermon years ago. It stuck in my mind. The title of it was, Never Pet a Powder. <laughs> That's good. That's exactly what she's doing. She came in there. She hugged up beside him. He won't even look at her. He's facing the wall. Got his head in the pillow. What's wrong, baby? <laughs> what? What's wrong? <laughs> I can't hear you, baby. What? You got your face in the pillow. What's What's wrong? What's wrong? A lot of people would call this being kind. <laughs> Bless their hearts. So ain't got nothing to do with their heart being blessed. <laughs> poor thing. Ain't no poor thing. He's the king. Baby, you got that right. <laughs> She's petting him, patting his head. Why are you so sad? You didn't eat your meal. I'm not hungry. Now you're laughing, I'm laughing. This is satanic. You didn't hear me. This is satanic. A man's about to die as a result of what's going on in this bed right here. Nothing okay about it. Urging people on to stay in things and do things that's wrong, it's the devil. Right. And he's done it through a lot of other people beside Jezebel. The list of names is too long to read right now. She's just one in a long, long, long list. But notice how she operates. She moves in and she goes, what's wrong, baby? He's muffled and muffled and Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. Finally, she gets it. Naboth won't sell you his vineyard. No. Big old baby. His people are hurting and needing his leadership and needing him to be a man and be a king and wisdom. And he's laying up in the bed feeling sorry for himself because he he's got, you know, 900 acres of vineyard. Can you see what's going on? His people are out there hurting and hungry. His troops need leadership. His people need help. He's supposed to be a king. Amen. He's laying up in here feeling sorry for himself. How many understand? Every time you're laying up feeling sorry for yourself, there are other things you're not doing that you're supposed to be doing. And it's a dark path. It goes down, down, down. He's in that room, she's in that room, and demons are in that room. When you yield to self-pity, wrong spirits are able to fellowship with you. You're yielding to them. Now, wonder who in this room has never, ever felt sorry for themselves. <laughs> Be hard to find now, wouldn't it? <laughs> Pretty much everybody in this room has yielded to this at some time or place. And it never helped you not one time. It only made things far, far, far worse. Right? And caused whole other problems that you didn't even have to start with. Right? This is the part I'm talking about, us changing. It won't happen just because you heard a message tonight. But could you change? Could you become like the master? And when the very thought of pity thyself came, you wheeled around. You said, get behind me, Satan. 
I ain't thinking on that for one second. I'm not yielding to that feeling or thought for one minute. No. Pity myself? Are you crazy? I'm going to give thanks to God. I got so much to be thankful for. I'm saved. My name's in the Lamb's book of life. They're working on my mansion right now. I got so much to be thankful for. I got my health. I got my strength. I got my mind. I got friends. I got family. I'm eating good. Got clothes to wear. Got a place to lay my head. And even if you don't, you got something to be thankful for. And we've already been talking about how to get the things that you don't have. You need grace. And how do you access the grace? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. She says, Naboth won't sell you his vineyard. He said, no. No. <laughs> she said, uh, Naboth the Jezreelite, he said, I said, give me your vineyard for money and uh, or else, if you want me to, I'll give you another vineyard for it. Huh? Uh, and he said, I won't give you my vineyard. Is that what he said? No. See, he's lying. One of the most gigantic parts of self-pity is Self. <laughs> self pity is self ish. Does he care about Naboth? He didn't care one, one thing about Naboth or his family. About what God wanted for Naboth and his family. He didn't care at all. He only cares about what he wants. It's not like he needs it. He said he won't sell it to me. And look at what this opened the door to. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Don't you govern the kingdom of Israel? Mm hmm. Get up and eat your bread, baby. And, and you go ahead and let your heart be merry. I'll get you that vineyard. Of that old mean Naboth. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. So see these people that received them, they thought they came directly from the king. Had his name and seal on them. And sent letters to the elders and the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. This is a tactic of the devil. Notice how he works. We're going to have a Naboth day and talk about how great Naboth is. He wants that to agitate people and get them primed to hurt him and harm him. And he said, and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him and saying, you blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. They're going to use the law. They're going to use the Bible to justify killing this innocent man. Tell me where this started. A thought about I should have that. It just gets worse and worse. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. There came in two men, children of Belia, and they sat before him. And the men of Belia witnessed against him, even against Naboth in the presence of the people. They said, Naboth blasphemed God and the king. Doing it according to what the word says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That's where that came from. One stood up and said, I heard him blaspheme God, and he blasphemed the king. Another man stood up and said, I heard him too. Both of them liars. And they, uh, they carried him forth out of the city and they stoned him with stones that he died. 
they sent to Jezebel, and they said, Naboth is stoned, and he's dead. Came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Get up, baby. Guess what? That vineyard, it's available. You can get it right now. Naboth is gone. You get up and get your vineyard. came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up, he went down to the vineyard of Naboth Jezreel to take possession of it. Is this devilish? You don't get much more devilish than this. Lying, killing, destroying, and stealing. Is this not obviously the work of the devil? Now, he could have caught this, even though he entertained the thought that he shouldn't have. It wasn't what, what led to this. You make it easy on yourself if you don't presume things with people. Presume nothing. Right? Expect and presume nothing of what people should or shouldn't do for you. Just be thankful for everything. That makes it easy on you. You just don't even have anything to deal with. So many people get stuff in their mind about what's supposed to happen and how it's going to be and what they're going to do for me and then they're going to do that. They get this whole scenario planned out until they decide that's it, that's it, that's how it's going to be. And then if they don't do it, they're shocked, they're mad, they're upset, they're hurt. And it's wrong. I said it's wrong. You had no right to expect it. But even if he'd let himself do that, could he have caught himself? When Naboth said no, could he have salvaged it right then? He could have caught himself. He could have said, well, it's his vineyard. I guess he can do what he wants to with it. And I shouldn't have let myself get to thinking about that. I shouldn't have let myself get all worked up about that and thinking that's what was going to happen. It could have stopped right there, couldn't it? It could have, none of that other junk would have happened. He, he could have stopped right there. He could have repented, went right on with his business. Like we've already talked about, it's possible God and Naboth could have been gracious to him later on. Knowing how the Lord is, he could have wound up with the thing. Right? But the real problem occurred when he went home and laid down on his bed and completely yielded to self-pity. That's when the devil got in control. Come on, can you see it? And then the devil inspired Jezebel to go in there and encourage him and pet him in that junk. Right? Why is the man dead, Naboth dead? Because, we already talked about that, a thought was the beginning of it, but he could have arrested that and Naboth not died. He could repent it. Why, was, why is he dead? Because Ahab felt sorry for himself. That's how he yielded to it. He's down there. Naboth's kids and spouse are crying their eyes out. At home. And he's down there looking over the vineyard. He's already got 90 other ones. Now, the reason I'm talking about this, your flesh will be exactly the same way if you'll let it. I'm talking about yours and mine. Every one of us. You can do exactly the same thing any day of the week if you let yourself. I know it sounds terrible, it sounds unreasonable, but that's just how the flesh is, and if you yield to it, the devil will accommodate you. I don't care how much scripture you can quote, how much you pray in tongues. If you yield to those thoughts and feelings, that's how you're going to go. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, and he said, get up. 
Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he's gone down to possess it. And you'll speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you'll speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick your blood, even yours. Now, a lot of people put too much emphasis on Jezebel. God's not talking to Jezebel. Hmm? Whose fault is this? Ahab. Who let himself think on all that stuff? Who, let it, who yielded to uh, self-pity and unthink? He did. He's the one that picked Jezebel to be his wife. It's his fault she's in the palace. I'm serious. God holds him accountable. Now, she got hers too, but Ahab's the real culprit here. When you let somebody do something for you to get what you want that you know is wrong, you are responsible for not stopping them. It's not okay to just stand by and you know they're doing something wrong to get you what you want. You say, well, I'm not doing it. Telling you what? God will hold you responsible. For what? For not stopping them. Could Ahab have stopped her? He was the king. He could have said, don't you dare. Don't you touch my seal. You you may not, you cannot do that. He could have stopped it. Saved the man's life. He didn't. He knew what she was doing. He wanted that vineyard. He didn't care how she got it. So the man of God found him. And he told him that. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He said, I found you. (laughs) Because you've sold yourself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Now stop right here. How did he sell himself to do evil? Yielding to self-pity. Behold, I'll bring evil on you and take away your posterity and cut off from Ahab him that pisses against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel. I'll make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation worth you have provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. That means none of his sons are going to ever rule in his stead. and It's the end of him and his whole line. And of Jezebel also spoke the Lord. He said, the dogs are going to eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. They're going to eat her too. Him that dies of Ahab in the city, the dogs will eat. And him that dies in the field, shall the fowls of the air eat. None of them is going to receive a proper burial. But there was none like to Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols. According to all things, so did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, he he rent his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. He repented. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Do you see how Ahab humbles himself before me? Now let's just stop right here. What does God do with the humble? He gives grace to the humble. And that includes everybody that humbles themselves. This is one of the most astounding parts of the story right here. What do you mean? Keep reading. The Lord said, do you see how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days, I'll bring the evil on his house. He's going to live out his life. (laughs) All this judgment ain't going to come on him. Somebody say amazing. Amazing. Now let's just stop. Is God being gracious to him? Does Ahab think he deserves this? Does he think God owes him this? No way, no how. He wouldn't be repenting in sackcloth and ashes if he did. 
he'd be strutting around acting like something was owed to him. After all he did, and Naboth was just one in a long list. He did a lot of stuff like this. You saw the scripture. There's, the scripture said there was none like Ahab that sold himself to do evil. I mean, he did every abominable thing you could imagine. And yet, after all this, he quit feeling sorry for himself. He quit feeling like somebody owed him something and repented before God and said, God, be merciful to me. I mean, if you're asking for mercy, that means you don't think he owes you any blessing or help. And it means you know that the judgment coming you deserve. But he humbled himself and repented and asked for, asked for mercy. Oh, this is, this is amazing to me. This is amazing. I mean, we, we haven't touched all the evil that Ahab done. Just this one story is bad enough, but it's multiplied thousands of times. And yet the Lord looks at him and says, he talks to his prophet and says, did you see how he humbled himself? Did you see that? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to postpone judgment for him because he's humbling himself like that in front of me. And all these terrible things not going to come on him. Somebody say, his mercy endures forever. Mercy. Say it again, his mercy endures forever. Mercy. Say it again, his mercy, his mercy. Endures, endures forever. forever. Oh, glory to God. Do you deserve mercy? Never. It's a gift. Let me go over this again in closing. What could Naboth have done differently? Excuse me, Ahab have done differently concerning Naboth. Because we never want to do anything like this or even remotely like this, right? Amen. That means we've got to do something differently than what he did. Yes. What could he have done? He could have caught that thought when it first came to him about how he ought to have Naboth's vineyard and how he's sure he'll sell it to him and let him have it. He's sure it'll wind up his. He, he should have caught that and cast it down. And said, no, that man owes me nothing. He could have stopped it before it ever got started right there. Even if he had missed it in that area like we've already said, and he had let himself build all this stuff up in his mind about how he's going to have this vineyard and what he's going to do with it, he's already got plans for it, and how Naboth should sell it to him or should let him have it. When Naboth told him no, what should he have done? He would have been disappointed because he's built this thing up in his mind. But he'll live. He's got all these other vineyards, right? What could he have done? What do you do when you're disappointed? <laughs> I said, what do you do when you're disappointed? You got something all built up in your mind, how it was going to be, and it didn't go that way. What do you do? What's your response? What's most Christians' response? What do they do? They're sad. <laughs> They're ugly. <laughs> I, uh, I remember one of the first major times in my life I yielded to this. And no exaggeration, it almost killed me. I, I was this close from you and I never meeting. I've always liked motorcycles. I mean, I used to love them. <laughs> but I learned better. I mean, I did. Other guys would have, uh, you know, posters of, of movie stars and girls in their bedroom. I had pictures of motorcycles. 
I had a motorcycle picture poster in my bedroom, and it was a guy riding on the road, and man, his hair was in the wind. I used to sit and look at that for hours thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now that's the stuff right there. In study hall, I drew pictures of choppers and bikes. I mean, this went on year after year after year after year. Well, I was about, actually, that was about 13. And I saw the opportunity to get one, a little bitty Harley. Well, I mean, it was about yay tall, but it's a small engine. And uh, my dad, who's in heaven now, loved me, loved us boys, the whole family. And we were all motorheads. We didn't have much money, but, man, we'd make it work, make it loud. And I saw this, this little bike, and it was cheap, and it was used and older. And we went and looked at it, and I was so hyped up over it, man, I was just fit to be tied. And I already had it built up in my mind. I could see me on this little Harley. Oh, man. I had me some blue jeans that had laces in the front. <laughs> Raw hide laces. I had them ready to ride that thing with that. And, and I could see my, with my jacket. Man, I, I was ready. I was ready. And I already, you know, I thought, well, it ain't that much money. We'll get it. Daddy will get it. And I didn't know then, but... You know, he didn't have much either, but we went and looked at him. We fired it up, drove it around a little bit. He came back. I'm so pumped. I just know, boy, yeah, we're going to go back and get it this evening. Maybe tomorrow morning, but probably this evening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Dad called me in. He's, he's, he's about to go to work. and He worked the evening shift. And he said, uh, he said, boy, I... I just don't get a good feeling about that, that motorcycle. He said, I, I don't think you ought to get that. I nodded my head. My lip was quivering. <laughs> I'm 13. I've never had a motorcycle. And I'm, I'm this close to all my dreams coming true. Because if I had this, if I, if I had this, I even told the Lord, Lord, if you let me have it, I'll ride it to church every service. <laughs> I did. I said, I, I ride it to church every service. I'll ride my Harley to church if you let me have it. Tried to kind of work a deal some way there. <laughs> and he said, boy, I, I just... I don't feel good about this one. I, I don't think you ought to get it. That's, we're not going to get it. I mumbled okay. I knew better than to pitch a fit, thank God. <laughs> it's amazing how ignorant so many people's kids are. I wouldn't have dared said anything disrespectful to him. I knew better. But I turned around, went out the back door, didn't have to go far. <laughs> it's just right there. <laughs> Screen door kind of slammed pretty hard. <laughs> I remember it vividly. I went out in the backyard. I kicked the dirt around. I was mad. <laughs> I was kind of half crying. I wanted that. I never asked for anything. Hmm? I work hard in the fields and I do everything he tells me to do. Of course, I'd have never told him this. <laughs> I make good grades. I'm on the honor roll. I pull the corn. And other guys go... They go swimming, and I don't, I don't go. I stay in bush hog the pasture. It ain't much money, it ain't. And I know, looking back now, I know he saw me. 
and he just couldn't handle it. And he missed God and changed. Are y'all with me now? He came out. He said, uh, look, boy. <laughs> I can hear him talking to us. If you want that thing, we'll go get it. We'll go get it tomorrow. Oh, Daddy, thank you. Oh, Daddy. Oh. But we're all missing God. The next day, I'm so excited. And we go over to the guy's house, and we get it. Now, I, I've ridden many bikes and some, you know, bicycles and stuff, but I've never ridden a motorcycle like this. I know how to work the clutch and shift. Uh, not really. I know it's there. Because the mini bikes had the automatic clutch, and I, I knew how to, you know, I'd rode it, ridden it around in the yard and stuff. I, we buy it, we start home. I, I pled and pled for him to let me ride it home because it was a little dirt road there and all you had just had one, one main road you had to cross, then you're on dirt roads, just back little trails, and I could ride it home myself. Pled and pled and pled, and he didn't want to, but he finally gave in, let me. And as I'm riding just a mile from that place where we bought it, I'm coming up on this road that's one of the busiest highways in that whole area. Traffic's just like this, and they're running fast. You know, they're 60, 70 miles an hour at least. And as I'm coming up on it, I panic and forget how, I don't know how to, to clutch it and stop it. And I'm unfamiliar with it. And ran right across the road without stopping. And I'm in a car, came behind me, whew, just like that. Almost died right there on the spot. I just skated by by the skin of my teeth. Just the mercy of God Amen. that you and I are looking at each other here tonight. Amen. I'm telling you, I was there. I know it scared me silly. I mean, the car almost hit the back taillight on the motorcycle. That's how close it was. I felt the wind. And that thing was a piece of junk. <laughs> it was a piece of junk. I rode it for a week or two, and it broke, and it sat in the garage for a year and a half. Dad was right. He should have stuck to his guns. He should have let me be disappointed. It's been a perfect opportunity for me to learn something. Did you hear me? Yes. And knowing him, no doubt, wouldn't have been long, we'd have found the right one. It would have been a different situation. See, the devil doesn't know everything, but he knows some things. And he can see some things going. And we gave him an opportunity to kill me and destroy the ministry. Yes. By my dad yielding to my self-pity. Are y'all with me now? Yes. Almost cost me my life and the ministry. Leaders be strong. Parents be strong. Fathers be strong. Husbands be strong. Never yield to somebody feeling sorry for themselves. Not your child, not your friend, not your sister, not your brother, not your mom, not your dad, not your spouse. Never, never let somebody pouting and feeling sorry for themselves lead you or cause you to make a decision or change your mind. It can be the very open door the devil needs to take somebody out, to destroy something, because can you see that's what he worked through? To destroy a neighbor's life? Yeah. Yeah. And it hasn't changed. 
It's exactly what he works through to this day. One thing leads to another, leads to another. You don't see it, but the devil's got a plan. He's got a snare. And if you yield to it, he can take you right down that path into destruction. What gave him place? Tell me again. Feeling sorry for yourself, which is being unthankful. Cuts you off from the grace of God, opens the door to the destroyer in your life. Stand up and say, not me. Not me. 